Right, thank you for coming along. Do you find it easier actually doing conventions these days now? Your sort of day to day involvement with Doctor Who is finished, feel perhaps as. Yeah, I think uh, in some ways it's easier to talk about things once you're no longer sort of on the payroll of, uh, of a company. Uh, inevitably, there's an awful lot of politics involved with programme making, and I think perhaps one is more free to uh, speak more openly once you're no longer, as I say, actually receiving a cheque from, from the company that you're bitching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so you, you can sort of say, yes, you're not, you're not restricted, are you, in what you can say. Um, just going back then, I mean, you, before you actually got involved in television production, you actually worked as an actor for three years and then moved into TV. I mean, what was the reasoning behind that? Well, basically, I wasn't very good, I think. Um, <laughs> I was extremely lucky in that uh, I wanted to, to work in the theatre. And uh, I started in the theatre, as most people do, as an assistant you know, floor, assistant stage manager. And inevitably, that meant that you also played parts. And I was really much more interested in, in playing the parts rather than setting the props. Um, and gradually got uh, more and more uh, uh, parts and better parts, leading parts. Um, and clearly that's really where my interest lay. Um, and it, at the time, uh, you know, just as now, there really isn't a great deal of work for actors. Uh, there was more around then because repertory companies were usually rather large and maybe there'd be 12 or 14 or 15 people, actors, employed by each company. Well, as we know nowadays, there are very few repertory companies and those that do exist only have a, a sort of basic company of maybe four or five people. Um, as I say, I was extremely lucky and I went from job to job to job. Over the three years, I think I had three weeks unemployed. Um, but eventually I realised that I think people basically liked me and I don't think I was a bad assistant stage manager but I do think that uh, the acting left quite a bit to, to be desired. I think I would say I was a very good amateur but not a very good professional. So then you, you joined the BBC as the floor assistant. I mean, was that just like another job or were you looking then for a sort of full career? In TV. Well, actually, uh, um, the, the job of floor assistant and its responsibilities were far, far less than the job I ended up doing in the theatre. Apart from the acting, I ended up as a senior stage manager and indeed a stage director. And from stage director in the theatre, uh, stroke actor, down to floor assistant was actually a downward move, a ginormous downward move. Um, it paid roughly the same, oddly enough. Um, but I, I did feel that uh, I wanted to desperately get into television, and I leapt at the opportunity. It was only a four-month contract, but I leapt at the opportunity, and it also meant that I could work in London, which I think when anybody is uh, you know, relatively young, that's the epitome, isn't it, to, to be working in the smoke and working for the BBC, you know, and whispering very quietly, doing this really awful job with uh, maybe good prospects, but not, not a very taxing uh, existence. Um, and I was delighted when at the end of the four months, they offered me another four months, and at the end of that four months, a third one. And at the end of the third, uh, an opportunity came up for a permanent position which I applied for and I was lucky enough to get. And of course, the minute you've got onto the staff, it means that you can apply for uh, a promotion, apply for a better job. And uh, within two and a half years of joining, I then became an assistant floor manager and so on, uh, all, all the way through all the, um, all the different production jobs that existed at the BBC at that time. And I will say that I, I don't regret doing any of those jobs because it meant I had the experience of working on all manner of programmes, from The Sky at Night to The Morecambe and Wise Show, from Blue Peter to um, religious broadcasts. Um, I worked occasionally on outside broadcasts and on film, and it really gave me an overall um, uh, 
perspective on uh, the, the industry itself and on, on, on television. And, and I could see precisely what interested me. So um, I feel I'm very privileged to have had that opportunity because it meant that any decision that you made about your career was based on at least some degree of experience in that area. Right, you also encountered a good program called Doctor Who at that time. Do you have any specific memories of those early shows that you worked on? Before with John Perwin and Patrick Trout? Yes, I, I mean, I think I mentioned in, in uh, the, the memoirs, so for those of you who might have uh, kind of looked at them, um, my overriding memory of the first one I did was the fact that the studio was on the fourth floor at Lime Grove and the dressing rooms were in the basement on the ground floor. And there was one rock lift that held about four people. And it was terribly slow. And I just remember spending days running up and down uh, those stairs, uh, collecting actors and taking them upstairs. It was absolutely horrid from that point of view. But it, was, it had a very, very uh, jokey, uh, workmanlike atmosphere. There were a lot of um, humorous people in the cast, like Donald G and George Layton, you know, who, who ended up writing situation comedy uh, programs, very, very successful. And there was this terrific atmosphere with Patrick and, and the, the uh, regular companions. So it was a very, very happy uh, memory, but uh, apart from those wretched stuff. Uh, with regard to the two stories I did with John, um, one of them I remember being very, very tense, and that was the one, um, is it the Ambassadors of Death, where there's a little sort of puppet-like creature with a wizard face? The Colony in Space? The Colony in Space. Yeah. That one was quite tense. There was uh, very bad uh, vibes amongst the production of team. And uh, that kind of thing has a way of filtering down onto the floor. Um, the, the tense is, is how I describe it. It was not pleasant, it was just tense. It was on tent hooks because there were these sort of uh, conflicts going, up, going on between the gallery and the floor. Um, and the other one, uh, extremely happy. Extremely happy. So then your first of real involvement with Doctor Who was um, when you worked on the Graham Williams shows as production unit manager. Mm -hmm. That was that was a new job created, wasn't it, the previous years around that time, is that right? Um, I, mean, I think it had been created for a few years before that, uh, but it was a relatively new job. Um, although in many ways it was really a new title, any show that was demanding had uh, a job called PA to producer. That was production assistant to producer. Not a PA in the sense of a, of a, like a secretarial job. Production assistant uh, is the equivalent of a production manager. Uh, in fact, the, the, the title eventually was changed to production manager. But PA to producer was a production manager attached to the producer who helped him or her uh, with the logistics of a very demanding show. And they suddenly realized that really the complexities of television were such that every show needed a production unit manager. And coincidentally, at the time, total costing uh, came into the BBC. Now in the old days, the budget uh, only uh, featured on a fairly small piece of paper, and there were only certain things that you actually sort of paid for or were accountable for. And uh, it, they then went for this total cost investment that every single thing was costed to your show, and it needed somebody to assist the producer in looking after that. Right, um, obviously during that era, um, well, towards the end of that era, you know, the grab volumes are starting to leave, and you became a successor. At what sort of point were you aware that you would be in the running for that job? Was it? Did you have sort of chance to be aware it would be vacant, or was it? Um, decision? Well, uh, the the at the end of Graham's second season, he asked me to stay on for the third, and I said that I really felt I wanted to do something else. 
but I would. Uh, and uh, I don't, don't mean to sound as though I was doing it grudgingly. Um, but I wasn't doing it with as much enthusiasm as, as I'd done the previous two years. And I was honest about it uh, to Graham and said, I will, you know, because you've asked me and, uh, you know, we were chums, you know, we, we went back a long, long way, Graham and I, uh, right back to the theatre we, we first met. And uh, I agreed to do it, and I su suspect, as a result of my honesty, he, he then went to the head of department and said that he felt my contribution to the show was such that I really should be um, have a special uh, title. And the title he had in mind was Associate Producer, which, oddly enough, a lot of production unit managers are now called <coughs> Associate Producers. It, it's odd that Graham was sort of ahead of his time. And he asked if they would agree to this. And the union <coughs> somehow got involved and said no. So with, uh, you know, great sadness, Graham explained that it wasn't possible to, to uh, give me the title, but he tried. And I think that what he'd done by asking that is sown a seed in the head of department's mind that if, I, if Graham were to leave, he's promoting John as an associate producer, then he must be a candidate for the job. And I think that's what happened. <clears throat> and I do know that when Graham handed in his resignation, he did again suggest that I took over. But obviously it's the head of department's decision, but um, certainly he was championing me. Right, now again, when you, when you took over, you made quite a lot of certainly very obvious changes to the show. Was that sort of, were you briefed on that, or was it just disappointment with what Graham went into, or just, you know, they've been there a long time, or was it just trying to put your stamp on it as a producer to do something different? Uh, no, it, it certainly wasn't, it certainly wasn't that at all. Now, you have to remember that the job of production mm -hmm. unit manager, um, if it's done properly, <coughs> is not really an artistic one. It's a scheduling one, a financial one. It, it isn't about art, really. It's about finances and logistics. Uh, therefore, I have no hesitation in saying that didn't stop me from having feelings about what Graham was doing with the show. And he knew what I felt about it. And he knew that I had major reservations about uh, what he'd done. Uh, that's my right, that's my privilege. I know that my associates and my unit managers had opinions about what I, what I was doing, you know, and quite right too, that, that we're all individuals. Um, but, but I knew that if I got my hands on it, it was going to not resemble what Graham had done. Now, that's, that, that's not being harsh, that's not knocking somebody who can't answer back. He knew how I felt about it, and uh, he saw it, the show going in one direction, and I saw it in another. And I did feel that he uh, allowed Tom uh, too much rain um, in terms of, of uh, the performance and the style. Um, that having been said, none of it was, you know, I'm the new producer, I'm going to change everything. There were things that I'd been wanting to change for ages. When you actually took over, did you know it would be Tom Baker's last season? No, not at all. I mean, how did you how did you feel about that? Because obviously you've got an actor who's been there a long time who. Well, I think at the time Tom um, said that it was going to be his last season. I don't think I'd been asked to do the next one. Right. So to a certain extent, uh, I didn't think it would be my problem. Um, it was only when I was subsequently asked did I realize that it was my problem. Um, but no, at the time he, he was ironed, I, 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 I didn't think I'd have to deal with it. I mean, were you happier about that in there? Obviously, it's, it's always a gamble changing the doctor. But on the other hand, you've got, again, a chance to perhaps take the show well, in a different it, direction. Well, it dishonest to say, you know, uh, uh, I wish he'd done another year. I mean, I was a young producer, and when you are asked to take something on, and you're in inheriting uh, somebody else's uh, project, 
um, it would be only a fool who, who wouldn't relish the idea of passing a new doctor, you know, or a new companion for that matter. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's an opportunity that you seize if, if the situation is forced upon you. Right. And uh, obviously then you, you chose, what were the reasons behind choosing Peter Davison? Uh, well, I think the, the principal one was, um, you know, I knew Peter, I'd worked with him on uh, All Creatures, Grunt and Smell. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I thought he was a splendid actor. He made a huge impact uh, with very little uh, television experience behind him. He made a massive impact, uh, particularly with the female audience. Um, you know, so he was a bankable uh, commodity, and uh, I, I felt in a way that it was a very, very hard job to follow Tom Baker. You know, he'd been there for seven years, he'd built up this amazing following, this kind of unique uh, Tomish quality, um, to all intents and purposes, but anybody under the age of 12 he was the only doctor, probably, that they could remember. So I think it was important to, to cast somebody who had a certain profile. Um, yeah. Right, so moving on to that, so you're asked to do a second season. Um, in the, in the between, it was around that time, there's also the, um, it's going up a slight tangent, you've got the canine special. I mean, again, was that, where did that idea come from? Um, the canine special idea really was um, the idea came really to pacify the press um, because what happened as I'm sure you all remember is that uh, newspapers, two newspapers, ran a save canine campaign, and I think I think if my memory serves me correct, uh, correctly, at least one of them was a front page story. And uh, the huge outcry, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're all bombarded with press this week, you know, on, on the topic of Diana. But I mean, this is a television program, we're talking about a bit of black. <laughs> it's a front page story that is, you know, being dismissed from its television show. It's absolutely ludicrous. Um, but the outcry was such that Bill Cotton Jr asked my boss to ask me to reconsider. Um, and I didn't want to reconsider at all. I, you know, I thought, God, no. That time I've got to bring the bloody thing back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I sort of burbled and stumbled and eventually said, well, what about the Christmas special? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the head of the department said, what a wonderful idea. I'll ring Bill now. And he rang Bill Cotton, you know, in the office when I sat there. And Bill Cotton said, yes, and it was as simple as that. Yes, we'll take it. So it really was, from my point of view, a song. Stop bringing it back into the show. That having been said, uh, it, we, we were doing it with a huge degree of... Um, confidence and enthusiasm, because I genuinely felt if there was this outcry, there would certainly be mileage in, in perhaps a short-run series. Um, but unfortunately, although they were delighted with it, it, it got uh, eight and a half million first time out, and uh, that was just before Christmas, and straight after Christmas, Bill Cotton um, resigned. And the new controller was Alan Hart, who was a sportsman, had been previously the head of sport. And um, he, he didn't like the idea at all. Well, he wouldn't, would he? Because it wasn't his idea. It was Bill Cotton, so exactly that, that was the end of it. Although he had the cheek, in my opinion, to repeat it the following year and get the same audience, get another eight and a half million. If, if it had gone to a series, would you have liked to have moved on to that as producer and moved on from Doctor Who, or would you? Yeah, I think, I think if it had gone to series, I, I would have handed over the main show and moved on from that. Right. Okay, we're moving on, obviously, quite, there's obviously a lot to cover because you've done so much, we're moving quite quick through this. Has anybody got any questions on sort of this era, like Tom Baker and the Davison era? I'd like to 
Why are we going there? You obviously have reservations about the canine, and obviously it's great fun to work with. You know, no. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. I mean, why, why would you then want to go on and do a, a mini series of it? Because the, the emphasis, uh, uh, the, the, the canine special was written with the knowledge of what it could do and what it couldn't. And um, uh, the writer, Terence uh, Dudley, um, you know, spent a lot of time finding out with us what it could do, what it couldn't do. And if you, if you look at the canine special, the dog actually doesn't feature that heavily. You know, I've always thought really the canine special was really a sort of version of heart to heart, you know, as reflected by the title. Um, but sadly, again, you know, where it ever does, we ran out of time. The idea was that, that Liz would have something like 50 costume time uh, changes and those kind of things. Uh, and so there's this truck load of uh, dresses, flesh change, and we ended with about 10. Because um, we've got short of time. But uh, you know, no, it was, it was structured. So, I mean, I would be quite happy to. to uh, you know, it's a bit like Charlie's Angels, really. I mean, you never really saw Charlie if you only ever heard him on the phone. Well, that's the way I saw the on the company. <laughs> 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 are we, can you still hear us at the back, or...? Yeah. 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 You need to have them quite close, yeah. they're, they're not that good. Right, any more questions for that, here? Um, there was some controversy at the time about season 20 having too much um, old monsters or villains coming back. Um, do you think it was the right decision at the time? Or? Yeah, I mean, the thing uh, about uh, producing the show is um, you can do no right. Mm. <laughs> if you don't have any old monsters, people write in the complaint. If you do, they love it when it's on the telly, and then afterwards dissect it and say it was all wrong. So, I mean, I did learn fairly quickly that you have to go with your instinct, do what you think is right, and, and where possible, ignore the postman. Because that way, that way, in a way, lies lunacy. Because if you respond to every letter and take every uh, criticism that's leveled up to you to heart, I really don't think you should be in the job in the first place. Uh, in retrospect, do I think it was wrong? No, I don't. I, I think it was, um, you, you know, I mean, we used the byline for the press that in every story there'd be something recurring from the doctor's past. In order. But some of the stories, it was, you know, it was a kind of uh, a black guardian and a white guardian, you know, you know it's no big deal, it was just a press line. Mm -hmm. Press line. Because going on from that at the end of that series, you've got the Five Doctors, which was was the, the ultimate return of everybody. Um, happy memories of that. The Five Doctors. Yes. Yeah, well, I really enjoyed that uh, show, um, in which we shot in Wales, most of it in Wales. It was it was a hugely ambitious project, uh, trying to get back so many people, and uh, I was quite pleased with it. And I think Terence did a terrific job. With a, with a very hard task at hand. Right, it's another question there. Yeah, what, what did you think of the new version? Did you prefer it or hate it? <laughs> the, the Paul McGann? No, the, uh, the new Five Doctors. The re I loved it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It turned a really exciting story into a boring yarn. Hmm. I mean, you don't cut stuff from a rough cut because it's riveting telling. <laughs> you cut it because it bores the arse off you. <laughs> and all those dreadful shots of people, you know, leaving the frame and holding on an empty view for three seconds. Row up and read a book. I thought it was atrocious, hopeless, <laughs> drivel. <laughs> <laughs> No, I should speak my mind. <laughs> no, I didn't care for it at all. There we go. <laughs> right, and neither did Peter Moffat. And it was done. Uh, I, I have the letters. Um, the two of us um, have letters of apology because we should have been consulted. 
and unfortunately, you know, one department blamed another department for not doing the clearance, but we both have grovelling letters because we could have could have insisted that it was with withdrawn from the shops because you, you know the copyright vests with us, but we decided not to do that and let it go ahead. But I, I still think it's atrocious, atrocious. Who wants to keep seeing those dreadful shots of corridors? <laughs> you know, only a set designer could love it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of re-edits, I suppose we, we should talk about the Curse of the Fenric, because again, there was, a, there was an extended version of that for much different reasons. Um, obviously, it's a nice day today. We're talking of locations as we are actually in one. Which um, has everybody been and seen the church yet? Or mm -hmm. oh, good, good, right? So, as you know, we'll be open at. Yeah, talk, talk about that that uh, re-edit of Fenric. Um, it could have been even longer if we put in the kind of stuff that they put into that five doctors, <laughs> so that you know, uh, Commander Millington. Instead of, you know, you watch a reaction and you cut, we could have held the shot for another three seconds where he continues the reaction. <laughs> you know, we could have. But all those, and we looked at them all, there wasn't any that, that Nick and I thought were worth reinstating because they added nothing to the story and actually just held it up, held up the program. Right, yeah. Like I said, the locations as tying up to that and Coast of Fenrir, it's a nice day today, which I know the weather wasn't quite as kind here. Is, is it easy finding locations like the church and that <laughs> for shooting? Was that quite easy or? No, it was, it was extremely difficult actually because uh, the script, as you know, required a church with a flat roof and uh, they couldn't, uh, the production manager I think was Ian Fraser, yeah. mm -hmm. and he couldn't find one anywhere. And um, yeah, a lot of wrecking is getting into the car and driving, and then maybe when you stop at the pub for a drink, you ask around, and somebody says, oh, I think there's one with a flat roof here, and so on and so forth. You go to libraries and uh, advice centres and so on. And uh, he was having a terrible time. And so we put an ad in uh, a paper. Um, I forget the paper now, but, but somewhere in the south, a big circulation newspaper chain, and uh, it just so happened the day before it was published, somebody told him about Hawkehurst, and he tootled along on the day that the ad came out and, and uh, found it. So in a way, I mean, you know, we didn't need the ad in the end, but um, I'm sure that would have probably brought us to Hawkehurst in any case. Um, well. Was it necessary that he was close to the army camp? Because Crow was only about 15 miles away. Did it need yes, to be close? We, we found the camp, and uh, therefore it had to be quite close. Right. And we we um, gave them a new roof, the, the flat roof. Uh, we we um, re asked it because it wasn't quite right for, for the period. So uh, we, you know, that was our facility fee. Was redoing that. Yeah, because it was damaged, actually damaged during the war, which, if you read in the booklets, most of what you see on the church the roof and the glasses was redone in the mid-50s. So. Well, any more questions? So yeah. What point did uh, was the decision made to do it entirely the location of the sheet uh, rather than as a studio location split? Um, about halfway through the preparation period, which is about six weeks, about halfway through that, and uh, Ian and Nick Mallett came to me and said that they wanted to shoot the whole thing on uh, tape, on location, because the uh, huts at Crowborough were right for period inside. And uh, so they felt that they could save all that uh, money not, not built on the interiors of the camp. And um, the, the uh, dressings of Commander Millington's, you know, we, we just have uh, kind of those in. So uh, about halfway through. And they promised me faithfully that the finances would work, but it was excellent. It 
was very handsome. Did the weather play a part in that in was no. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Um, on several of the stories you've done a bit you have you've done a bit of directing where you know, what's going on. Is that something you've enjoyed doing and something <laughs> you wish you'd done more of? I really enjoyed uh, doing the, the second unit on, on Fenwick, uh, particularly, because uh, it meant I, I had to play with all the gear that I'd never played with before, like underwater cameras, uh, which, uh, you know, is riveting, um, because, it, it, you know, you can't, you know, you can communicate with the cameraman, but he can't communicate with you. So, you know, you can say, oh, a bit further to your right, and, and because of, um, I forget the word, but you know, the, the movement that water makes everything so slow. Normally, um, if for some reason the, the, the cameraman doesn't want to speak, he can sort of nod at you or shake his head. And you can't really do that with the, the pressure of the water. Um, but it, I mean, it was terrific fun to do, it really was. It was so bitterly cold. Um, and Graham, uh, Brown and his lads would stand in uh, for the actors in their, their wetsuits, and then we'd get the actors into the water at the last, uh, the last minute. Okay, any more questions? Any call otherwise? Anybody? One over there. What? Uh, when did you actually decide that the curse of Fenwick? Would star vampires? Oh, uh, I can't. Do you know I can't answer that? I can't remember. It must have been quite early, I guess. Um, I'm not even sure whether it was our idea. It might even have been Ian, Ian Briggs' idea. But it must have been quite early on, I'm sure. Well, I mean, would it be something you would consider when doing the script where there's like, obviously, it effectively is a new monster for the show, isn't it? It's one of the sort of last new monsters. I, I mean, just to sort of relate yeah. to that, I, I, um, do you know, it must have just come in with the script, I think, because I'm sure if, if Ian had said, Shall we do a vampire story? I'm sure I've said no. So, so I think it, he must have uh, convinced me by doing a, a scene breakdown or something. Because my instinct would have been, oh no, far too scary. But I think it must have come in. And he sold it quite brilliantly, like an idiot or something. You know? Thank you. You'd already done vampires in State of Decay in your first season, I suppose. Yes, but. Uh, no. Right. Any more questions? Right. One over here. What do you think of Tom Gale movie? Um, I was madly envious of the amount of money that was spent on the project. I mean, madly envious. Um, I, I didn't like the story very much. But if I'm honest, I thought he was fine. I just didn't think the story was um, tip-top. Do you have any sort of ideas what you would do differently if you had the chance of relaunching it? Yeah, it's something that would grab. Okay, any more questions? Um, people often make comments about the lack of money on Doctor Who productions. Do you think that uh, sort of an issue of quality of Doctor Who is something to do with the vast objections of cash? Because never made it any more than it was. Um, with the normal gambling for all its faults, the special effects didn't seem, didn't make the, ple the pleasure element of it wasn't particularly to do with special effects for me. Yes, I, I know what you mean. I, I think um, I think if the script is strong, it transcends any shortcomings that, that one has financially. Um, it, now, I don't want to uh, run down 
it, what a lot of talented people have done. Uh, and I don't want to uh, knock uh, my work too heavily all of it, uh, because I think that some of the sets and some of the effects and some of the makeups and some of the costumes in my time have been absolutely stunning and feature film standard. Others have not been quite as successful. So I don't want to apologize too much uh, for all of it. Um, but I felt with the movie, I thought <coughs> the, the sets were gorgeous. And it, you couldn't fault the costumes. Um, it was wonderful to see scenes where, you know, it wasn't seven extras milling around trying to look like a hundred. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you could see the money, you know. Um, but I know what you mean. It, it's almost that, that part and parcel of its charm is the fact that it, it isn't super duper lush. I, actually, I don't think any science fiction is, you know, let's be honest. I mean, if you look at some of, some of the Star Trek, and you, you, you know, some of them are really a bit iffy production values, um, and certainly iffy script lines uh, every now and then. Um, but I, I, I don't know what the answer is, really, because inevitably a feature film, it's got to look lavish. It's got to look splendid. But maybe it didn't look splendid enough, I don't know. And certainly the British production is what made it appeal to Americans in the first place, so to change that just seem to be getting away from what the show is about, yeah. isn't it? There's something, if, if money is limited, there's something about the attitude of the professionals who work on it that somehow lifts everything to transcend that lack. So everybody gives us a bit more clock. Do, do you know what I mean? To make up for it. Um, <coughs> and, and directors say to actors, you know, is it possible if you don't make that move? It's, it's got a piece of scenery behind you. you cover it later. Yes, I'll cover the scenery. Um, it, 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 everybody kind of gets behind it. It, it's not a case of oh, it's only a Doctor Who. It, it's we don't have Doctor Who to make this look good. Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Just another so to Carry on from that slightly. You said you, you thought some of the effects and things in your time were stunning. Are there any ones that stand out in your mind that you particularly think were? Um. Uh, there aren't any that, that sort of immediately come to mind, uh, you know, I'd like notice of, of that. But some of the, for example, it's not actually a special effect, it's an electronic effect, but the transformation from uh, Peter to Colin is terrific, terrific, uh, fabulous sound effects, fascinating to look at. And, it wasn't for really. So it's not really a special about it. So, some of the disintegrations of the characters have been splendid. Uh, I, I, I think um, nowadays, because uh, television makers will constantly do the movie about how the movie was made, and the television program television was there. You know, we all know too much now. The general public know too much about how shows are made. Uh, I, I, the writing was on the wall in the 60s when Top of the Pops started letting the cameras be seen in shot and the lights being shown. And it's just gone downhill from there. You all know so much because you're bombarded with it. You know what a cutaway is. You know what a two shot is. Now, go, going back 30 years, that, that was just a foreign language. Now you know so much about it, your expectation is the greater. The greater and greater. And the more you learn about it, the higher your expectation. You know, 
Uh, let's go and see independent uh, they spent 15 pound on 15 million pounds on, on special effects alone. Your expectation is the greater. And by the way, here's an hour's documentary on how the effects were done. And that's just below 15 million pounds worth. Programs about stunt men. You know, you know how stunts are done now. And so it's gone on. The industry has ruined the magic for its own audience. Right, okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. There's a lady at the back there. Um, I have a question for about the lack of funds for Doctor Who. Do you find that the lack of funds for Doctor Who then, that the interactivity, because of the lack of funds, you were saying that Arsenal and Tim do you think that came over in the actual filming, that basically interacting with more, with the people more, you know, it's all one, you know, this is Doctor Who, we are. It's in a, you know, rather than you know, separate people doing separate things. Yes, I think you're probably more more uh, able to answer that than me. But I think so. I think there is that uh, feeling. You know, um, uh, in the, the BBC canteen, uh, and I've seen this happen so many times. Um, famous actors will come up to. A, one of the guest stars that's working on, on Doctor Who, and they'll say, oh, you know, hi, Dyke, what are you up to? And they say, well, we're doing a Doctor Who. Oh, I've never known, but I'd love to do it. So everybody gets that Philip, you know, which helps, and I, I, I'm sure that part of that comes across on the telly. Uh, every single actor has got a child, or if they don't have a child, they have a nephew, they have a grandchild who likes the show. There's always someone, you know. I don't want you to think when actors go around and say, I'm only doing this for my niece. They don't. <laughs> they do it because they know their stock has gone up. You know, and I, I, I do feel that that is conveyed to a certain degree. Okay, time for one more question then. Anybody? We'll take those two. Gentleman there, gentleman there. So if you're to go first, and then that gentleman. Do you think the film might have been more alive and up if they, if we had seen more of some type of Dalek race? Yes. I mean, I believe. I don't know how true this is, but I believe that they did approach uh, Terry Nation in order to use the Daleks at the beginning and that he wanted uh, a great deal of money, and so they abandoned the, the idea. Uh, personally, I think they should have dropped the whole idea and, and used something else, because uh, it did feel to me as though we were being cheated uh, out of not seeing them. And I, I think it would have, would have helped the beginning. And also, it, you know, it's part of that thing of being synonymous with the show. It's part of that... Uh, uh, the whole mood of, of, of Doctor Who. To anybody who knows what the show is, they would have just sort of, oh yes, and you can bet your bottom dollar that would have been in every trail. You know, would have, would have, uh, would have been preferable. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, final question from the gentleman there. John, what do you feel the future is for Doctor Who, uh, television-wise? Do you think there is a future? Yes, I, I hope that uh, that isn't the end of it. Um, I think what needs to happen uh, to it is that it should go back to the BBC and that uh, the BBC should remake it. Uh, what about an independent company? That seems to be the way these days. Yes, okay, if you insist. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you've got the news that lays the golden egg, it seems to me that you ought to hang on to it rather than. I hadn't heard that, but, but uh, could be, could be. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think we've seen the, the last of it. Uh, and I don't think some people say, oh, you know, the McGowan movie has done irreparable damage. I don't think that's true either. Uh, that's the big screen version. Now let's get back to the small screen version, uh, 
which is where it has sat so happily and so comfortably for such a long time. Right. Right, I think that seems a good point to end it. There will be a chance to speak to John later on our big panel, but for the moment we'd like to show you thanks to John Nathan Turner.